yeah, so in summary, we've all docked very nicely. We've got our arms in, there's no adhesions, there's a good fissure. So I'm ready to go when you guys are ready. And, uh, and what, we'll get what started. Are instruments have you actually got in? Yeah, so we've got a. Uh, okay, um, I'm just going to just see if it's a focusing issue. And that's pretty good. Is the vision. Is, can you just make um, the, corner, so the uh, corner camera, the corner screen a little smaller? Right. So we've got a tiny bit of blurring on the camera, but it should get better. So I just, to, and can we set up the bipolar uh, set at 70, thanks? Shipyard, yes. And so on, is it? Okay. So I'll just show you the instruments we've got. We've got uh, in, uh, you might be able to see in the corner, the sort of numbering system. Can you see that numbering system? No, don't have it. I don't have that, okay. So, um, so in port three, we've got this, which is called the uh, the long grasper. It's uh, it's quite a nice, delicate, uh, small instrument. Um, it's really good for sort of just gently pushing the lung away. Uh, you can either gently use it like that to push away, or you can we can grasp very gently, and it doesn't cause that much damage to the lung. Um, we've then got uh, this is which is called a cadia, which is another quite gentle instrument that you can grasp and it doesn't cause all that much damage uh, to the tissue. And then we've got this, which is a bipolar, uh, curved bipolar, and I can give energy with this and dissect and I can get around vessels very nicely. So, and then I always have uh, two of Surf cigars. Um, the Jean-Marc Bass calls them tapadou, but I think that's slightly gross. But, uh, so I stick to Surf cigar, as they're called. They're very useful if you have any bleeding or anything like that. So how did you make those cigars? So, how did, Lauren, how did you make those cigars? So I asked Lauren very nicely uh, if she doesn't mind uh, getting a normal swab and just suturing. She just does that. She's done a beautiful job of doing that while she was waiting for the patient to come in. There are some commercially manufactured ones uh, that's, that you can get, some ENT type ones, but uh, Equally, being nice to your, your scrub nurse uh, is very good. They're actually very useful in vats, I think. It's nice to have them in the chest. You can just quickly grab them and, uh, and it helps very nicely. So, and I quite like grabbing them to just push the lung away to be delicate. One other thing to just notice is I've got my assistant port just here, so I can keep an eye on my assistant. I've got quite junior assistants at, at my place, so, so I really don't like them poking. When I have the port right down there, they kept hitting the diaphragm, and, and then when I put the camera in by vats, they were, you know, there was all sorts of little bits of damage. So I do like keeping an eye on my assistant. So, is that any other questions? Or it's good? Anybody have any questions? So what I'm going to do to no. start, I'm just going to, yeah, you happy? Yeah, we're happy. Good. So, oh, look at that. He's so nice, is that Manos? He's kind of, uh, I probably owe him some kind of drink for a beautiful. Uh, fissure like that. Um, it's just uh, just having a little play with this. John, can I ask you a question? Uh, yep. Yeah. So, have you got sure. through a um, WHO safety check about what you would do in the event of an emergency? Absolutely. Yep. Yeah. Um, so, what we said in the WHO checklist is that we've got three practiced emergencies. Uh, so if I call out right now that I've got controlled bleeding, then what I'm going to do is I'm going to stop. Uh, my anaesthetist Andy Lum is then going to ask for some blood to be in the room and a cell saver, and I'm not allowed to do anything until he tells me to start again. That's if I've got controlled bleeding that I'm happy not to convert for. There's the tumour, by the way. Um, but the second is uncontrolled bleeding. If I say we've got uncontrolled bleeding, then I'm going to leave the table and we need to do uh, an emergency thoracotomy as quickly as possible. So the staff are going to uh, take all the arms out of the robots, they're going to push it back, and they're going to do a thoracotomy. And then the third, uh, then the third um, cut emergency is if the patient arrests that I think is absolutely nothing to do with me, so you know, an arrhythmia or, or an MI or something, then we're going to take all the ports out and put it on our back because we need to do a stenotomy or do a massage. So we've got three emergencies that we always describe. And, uh, and we've, we've gone through that with the staff here today. Okay. So I'm just uh, having a little look around the chest. Just gently, I'm just going to move this lung forwards a bit. So I'm going to use arm three just to 
So move this little lung forward a bit, just, uh, and then, and, uh, and then, nice thing about this, Manos has got a sucker, he can help if he wants, but, but actually for very small amounts of, of, uh, of ooze, then it's just better to uh, use this little surf cigar. So, as you can see here, we've got uh, we've got the inferior. So, how's your camera set up? You've got a 30 degree, a 30 degree camera. Uh, no, I use straight camera. I prefer the straight camera. Okay, and, it's, uh, and, uh, the reason I prefer the straight. The reason I prefer a straight camera is because uh, is because I think it drips a little bit less. I think the 30 degree, it just uh, it just didn't work great for me really. So. So, uh, and surf uses zero, so I changed from 30 to zero, and I was being very pleased with it. And just remind so, me which port is your zero degree camera coming in from? Um, so we've got four ports in the chest. We've got one two centimeters uh, from the vertebral column. We've got one 12 centimeters, and we've got one 24 centimeters. So it's uh, in the eighth space, which is above the ninth rib, uh, and, uh, and 22 centimeters from the uh, from the uh, vertebral column. This is the SI. So, the SI so one nice thing about the robot is that I've got this third arm to retract, yes. so I can F6. keep sort of moving it around, uh, and then I've got two hands to do all my uh, to do all my dissection. I'm just sort of going slowly and things, just because I'm enjoying myself. So I can just uh, use this uh, lung retractor to just get that out of the way. Then I can leave it there, and then I can uh, use two hands to have a look down here. And you do get, you know, I think pretty nice vision. And just, mag I'm just, uh, I was just magnifying, I was just uh, uh, focusing it there. You can focus on the console, so you can see, you know, very clearly things like that lymph node, which I'll be taking shortly. And uh, and you can see things like this little thing, which might be a lymph node. It's actually, no, it's just a bit of lung, but. But uh, you get what I think is great vision. Just focusing it. And then this is the bipolar. So you can use a hook, but I quite like, it's a sort of pinching motion. And I don't particularly think it's the best way to do diathermy, but it's, it's great that, that you can then get round vessels without changing arms in the patient. So just think it's a nice, clean way. It's nice to not change arms. Things that slow you down in robotics are bad vision on the camera from dripping uh, and changing arms all the time. So, so obviously, Joel, um, you're at the console. Um, who's uh, at the yeah, table at the moment? Is Lauren? Yeah. Is someone with the camera? Do you want to pan back on the camera? Yeah. So, so I'm over here. I need my cup. I need my cuppa. <laughs> But uh, so, so I'm just here on the console, and then we've got Manos and uh, and Lauren and our and our team, and uh, you know I'm in good communication with the team. This has got speakers on it, so I can I can sort of talk to them, and also I can look at them. They're all just here, so so I'm in good communication with them, and uh, and so you know I do feel quite linked to the team. So hopefully they they don't think I'm too far away. Um, and, uh, and we've set up our console so it is nice and close uh, to them. I tend to, I haven't done it today, but I tend to just have a gown and gloves ready as well, just in the scrub room if I ever want to get scrubbed quickly. But that's a minor thing. We've got Manos. Yeah, if I need to open, then Manos is doing it, and I'm getting in my car and running. So, so you can see there's the inferior vein just coming up there quite nicely. So we'll be opening that in just a second. Probably best off just again getting my third arm. So the nice thing about robotics you know, is you've got three arms, so you're, you are your own assistant. Uh, you, you're also in control of your uh, camera, which I hope you think is a pretty good quality camera. I mean the 3D VATS cameras are good as well, but this is good and also I'm in full control of it. I'd say probably that this lung's a little bit inflated, but the CO2's getting it down, uh, even if sort of isolation isn't perfect. And uh, Joel. just try and get the focus. Yeah, the focus is pretty good there. And uh, Joel. Yep. Yeah. Um, you. Yeah. Is that a question? You created 
trained in that lobectomy to start with, didn't you? Yeah, that's right. Bill Walker so, taught me how to do it. So, what and difference did it make, uh, for instance, when you're dissecting the fascia over the vein and other vessels, uh, and the lack of haptic feedback? Um, yes, yeah, so I think the lack of, uh, of tactile feedback is, is, is not an issue. I kind of, you know, you hear the argument and you almost believe it yourself as a vet surgeon that you've got tactile feedback, but actually I think we all rely on visual feedback entirely um, because I never remotely miss um, not being able to feel because I'm looking at the tissue. So if we come up to this vein here, so there's the vein. If I start poking it, I can see that I'm poking the vein. I'd never be able to feel that by vats. You're going to see that you're poking a vein before you can feel it. That's got a pressure of 10 millimetres of mercury in it. That's not going to push my VATS instrument back before I can see that I'm poking it. So I don't really think we do have brilliant tactile feedback in VATS either. And I did think it until I started robotics, and then I, I haven't missed it at all, tactile feedback. I think it's, uh, you know, not an issue, tactile feedback. I even recommended to Medtronic that they didn't bother with the... Uh, getting haptic feedback because it's technically a very difficult challenge but it's one of those things that people feel is a barrier to robotics it's all visual feedback I think as long as you've got a good view there you go and you can see hopefully you can see you know we've got an immaculate view of this what looks like quite a big station R8 lymph node yeah, the view you know, is and uh, maybe by that yeah, so it's a lovely view. I'm going to try and keep it as clean and dry as we can. So does the CO2 help in getting rid of the smoke? Or is it something yeah, else? Yeah, it's, it's a, yeah, it's a great smoke evacuator. So, uh, yeah, I'll just focus this nicely. You can focus on the console. Yeah, so, so yeah, it's a nice smoke evacuator, CO2. And uh, so, yeah, so we don't usually have smoking problems early on. We were mainly having dripping uh, trouble. That was our, our worst problem. And I think we fixed that by, by using a 5mm uh, camera to go in and then pushing the 12mm port in rather than a big dissection where it oozes. Uh, and also by using a straight camera. It seems to drip off the bottom of the camera rather than drip along a 30 degree angled uh, camera. So obviously I like to take lymph nodes in their entirety. This is it's quite a gentle grasper. Again, if you do grasper nodes, you can break them up because yeah, I don't have that feel, but I like to take them out whole. And you've got bipolar rather than a hook, so that's quite good for hemostasis. And uh, as Scott said, it's always good to have that backed up view. You can get very sucked into what you're doing in robotics. So it's always good to just pull back and check yourself out because it is so nice, the view, when you get close up. Take one piece of fat at a time. And uh, Manus, do you want to come in with a grasper to take out this lymph node? I think this is a R8. Hopefully everybody agree. We can name our stations by, by committee. So, so now I interact with my, my thing. So now this is, I think, it's just a real advantage of the subsifoid port. This you don't do in normal robotics. You can't see uh, when it's leaving, whereas I know this, this is going to come through. There's going to be no seeding there. That is, uh, you know, nicely and beautifully taken out by Manus. Well, and that's an R8, I think, because there's the esophagus just down there. So yeah, there's the esophagus just there. So, so I'm still retracting with my third arm, just pushing that could be, could be a bit better. I've got a little kick, kick uh, button down on the floor um, to, to change between them, so, so it literally is a very fast motion. So I'm just, uh, gen I like to not particularly touch the lung or grasp it because it can, it can just sometimes uh, tear and bleed. And you can see this sort of cigar is quite a nice thing to just keep everything dry. I do like to keep the area dry. So we've got our vein there. I'm just going to strip up the back of the vein and go and take station seven. I kind of like to take the lymph nodes first because it does some of the dissection for you as well. 
So there's the inferior vein there, and I'll just uh, come up here. Surf does this in about two seconds, strips it all up. To... And again, we could change to a hook diathermy to do this, but I don't think I'm happy doing it this way. There's lots of different instruments people use. So Bernie Park uses a spatula. He finds that his favorite instrument. Uh, Franca uses a hook and uh, surf uses bipolar. Jean-Marc Bast in uh, France uses a bipolar, but he set it up so he can cut as well as coagulate. So he can just, he just quickly presses coagulate and then he has a separate button that he's set up himself uh, to cut. So he doesn't get all this charcoaling on the, on the arms because this just does charcoal up a little bit. And that really is a very elegant way to do it. But then the French are very elegant. And he's also got a lovely unit. He's also thought very carefully about the safety steps and regularly practices uh, the de-docking with his staff. He insists on always having a, a sucker, a, a, a rough sucker on the, on the scrub table because uh, these small suckers don't work in big bleeds. And, uh, and he's always got a retractor ready and prepped. And even though emergency thoracotomies are rare, if you do have to do one and, you, and there's a, a nurse trying to put the, the, thoraco, the, the retractor together in an emergency, it's very disappointing. Sorry, Joe, I'm going to so pick we up always have one. Yep. Joe, can I pick up Adam? on something that yeah. you just mentioned? You mentioned that in a big bleed you need a big sucker. Now, is that connected to yeah. a cell saver or not? No, rough sucker. So Jean-Marc Baster has a, a big sucker, uh, one of those big metal ones with lots of holes at the side. And, uh, and I have had one big bleed where it just, the sucker just wasn't powerful enough. So I quite like that from his, uh, his, his setup. I haven't had to use it yet, but he has. So, so yeah, sometimes a small, thin, that sucker just doesn't do it. And in a big bleed, when you're in the chest and you're in a thoracotomy situation, you've got to get rid of the blood to see, to see what to press on. So, and sometimes they block up very easily, some of these suckers. So we've adopted his safety recommendations. It's on, it's on a separate table. So it's not, it's not in the way. Yep. Yeah, that sort of thing. Yeah, with lots of holes all down the side. Just because in, in a huge pool of blood when you really want to see, um, those just work great. It's on a separate table for him, Jean-Marc Bast, and so it is out of the way, so it doesn't cause any inconvenience, I don't think. So obviously there's the azygous up there, we've got the bronchus intermedius here, and uh, we're just uh, dividing up uh, some of the pleura just to get to station seven. One of the real joys of robotics is is the vision for lymphadenectomy. I know that's one of the things people talk about a lot. So we thought we'd do a nice job, but we've seen the tumour already. And, uh, Is there any difference in chiropractic or actuation? Joe? Yep. Yeah. Scott wants to know yeah. whether you, uh, you, you know, either you're, in your experience or in the published literature, is there any Evidence, uh, any, is there any difference in the kind of thorax rates between robotic and VATS? Hmm, that's a good question. Um, yeah, I, I, I don't know the answer to that at all. Um, I've not yet had one. Um, I've, I've done two thoracic duct ligations, uh, but I've, I've not seen the thoracic duct in a VATS lobectomy yet. I mean, probably Scott, Scott knows a lot more about thoracic duct as he's probably an esophageal surgeon as well, but yeah, I don't know the difference. Does anybody else in the audience know if the, what the rate is? I think, should we, the should we call that R10? I think that might just be below the lower lobe bronchus. Uh, Manos, if you want to, uh, do you want to just take that and we'll call that an R10? The, it's the lower lobe bronchus is the is the marking point of R10. So, and then a bit deeper in, we're going to have there's a, another little lymph node hiding there, isn't there? So I probably should have started right at the inferior vein. I was a bit lazy. So. 
So you know, Costas did a lovely job of showing us the, the correct plane to go in yesterday. So I'm sure if he's there, he'd be telling me to go a little bit deeper. So I'll, I'll do what he's thinking. I think what is most important is not just getting into the right plane, but I think what is most important generally is that you stay on the right plane soon and eventually. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, and I'm not quite in the right plane there, am I? Just a little bit, a bit of a little woolly jacket. Safety wise, you know, if uh, obviously Costas, you had know, some very difficult, very delicate veins, and one of these veins oozed a little bit for you in a robotic. I can just grab that straight away and then I can swap this out for a needle very easily. It's a, and I can even get my third arm to come down. So, so bleeding is very easily dealt with actually things like you had yesterday from that delicate vessel. So, so because a lot of people obviously, you know, you worry that if you feel very remote and far away from the patient, bleeding is quite stressful, but actually it grasps beautifully any bleeding vessels. And so, so which is a nice thing. And we've been able to re-staple using staple lines and put clips on and things under good control because you've got good vision. So, so George, do you think the articulation helps in grasping the vessel more easily? Um, yeah, it's very easy to grasp the vessel wall uh, and, and to, to control small bleeds on a, on a vessel. So which is sort of what the, I mean, the real bleeds that we've had are little things like that, which I've found very easy to control. Some segmental PA branches in, our, in some videos, again, robotic surgeons have been very well able to control them because you just grasp. So if something bleeds here, I'll just grasp it. And you can, you can grasp a six millimeter vessel and a completely evolved vessel, you can grasp quite nicely and, uh, and at least sort of control it and decide what to do according to your confidence, which is a nice thing. Sometimes. You know, by VATS, you've only got two instruments and it's a bit less easy to grasp. Can I, I'm can just I spending ask, a little bit of time just... Yeah. Can, can I ask yeah. you, uh, does robotics mean you have to be more ambidextrous than VATS? Uh, no, I think VATS, it's vital to be ambidextrous. It's utterly vital to be an ambidextrous surgeon as a VATS surgeon. If you're crossing your arms and, and not being able to try each port, it's a massive inhibition. But luckily we don't actually have to suit you with both hands, so you don't have to be the world's most ambidextrous person. But, uh, so I'm left-handed, uh, but I'm using this in my right hand, because, uh, and then when I'm on the other side, you know, you do it the opposite way around. So, you know, I think all good VAT surgeons should be ambidextrous. I think I certainly noticed René doing everything, you know, he, he with both hands very nicely, and Costas, so they were both very ambidextrous people. So. And I hope everybody here agrees that that uh, you know all that surgeons should be ambidextrous to a certain extent, or train yourself to be fairly ambidextrous. Uh, I'm an abused left-hander. Can I ask you a quick question, Joe? Yeah. In in bad in bad yeah. in bad surgery, um, you can overcome the experience of an assistant because you are at the table, the operating table, and you can certainly take yeah. over certain actions. Now, yeah. in, the, in the robotic surgery, you sit in the console and you have to rely on the assistant. What happens on a day where you have a list and your regular assistant who's been trained for robotics might not be available? Are you going to go ahead and do the cases or are you going to cancel them? Yeah, well, our situation was kind of even more sort of significant because we, we only had two consultants in Middlesbrough, so I couldn't do, I couldn't start my program with a fellow consultant. So we decided that oh, I can't have a registrar training because I'll leave in six months. So we started the program training up a, a surgical care practitioner who has no experience of thoracotomies uh, and had only taken vein before. So, so that person, you know, you, you sh she, he, she was tremendously junior. So, so robotics can take away virtually all of the need for a senior sort of assistant because you do everything. So the only thing she has to do is be able to fire a stapler. And as I'll show in a little bit, the, the gold tip uh, with, uh, with a leader calf means that it's very simple to, to, get, a, to get around all the vessels. So, so luckily, and also if you can see the port, like we can see it, then there's very little that they can do. So really, 
it's the safety steps I need her for. And hopefully, if I'm careful, she won't ever need to do that. Thoracotomy, I think that's a bit more R10. That. So, so Joe. Joe. Yeah. Joe. Yes. So that leads on to the question. So, uh, how do you think you'll manage to train uh, um, so trainees in robotics? Because there's a take lot that more. And then come back for that little bit. Yeah. So take that out and then come back for this tiny thing. We're, we're going Japanese here, aren't we, with our meticulousness? Um, so training-wise, I'm training my, or helping my new consultant's uh, colleague who's, who has done some with Bernie Park, but uh, I just, uh, and then especially diaphragm locations, I get my registrars to go and do 30 hours on the simulator, and if they can come back showing me that they've done that, and I go and watch to check that they're not lying, because I can see straight away, then they, when they sit down, they are perfect, they're really good. So I start them off with a diaphragm location doing a few stitches, and then uh, and I just get up, stand right next to them, and uh, any time they get stuck, we stop. And, uh, and it's working very well at the moment, so Ian's having a good experience. You can stand right next to them. Uh, Nathan, are you there? Can you write on the screen, just write a message to everybody? So if, if Nathan was my, uh, my proctor, he can go up to the screen, and he can write something on the screen for me. So maybe if he can demonstrate that. <laughs> I also hate the word rats for robotics, but there we go. It's not a ratty operation. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so he just wrote so. So Nathan, could you draw a line on the uh, bronchus intermedius? That's that thing there. So pretend you're telling me, don't hit this vessel. So he can draw lines to tell me what to do and what not to do. The biggest risk with uh, training is if I were to lose control of this arm and let go with my hand, because it doesn't have haptic feedback, it kind of continues. So I don't want to let go of something and let it clatter in. And I don't want to lose these out of the field. If that goes out of the field, I don't know where it is. And there have been some cases of very bad things happening when it's out of the field and people have been moving it, assuming it's somewhere. There's been one case of transepting the aorta, which is not good. Uh, and that's because it got, went out of the field. So, so once you can control your instruments, you can, you're very safe in the chest, but you do need to do the simulation work. But the great thing about that is you just do it when you're on call as a registrar when it's quiet. Once all the cardiac patients have gone back for bleeding. That's another R10, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> so you'd only just got a grasp there, but I can see in the port that we're safe and that, uh, yeah, so that's great. Whereas if that had disappeared, down by the diaphragm, I wouldn't have seen that. Uh, I think so, yeah, it's uh, your patient, so, but, but uh, yeah, so I can see nicely the bronchus intermedius and uh, just carry on down this uh, lymph node dissection. Certainly a lot of robotic surgeons think that lymph node dissection really is exceptional with the robot. And, and the thing is, I mean, we're in a VATS course, and all you guys are phenomenally good, competent VATS surgeons, so you can all do this. I mean, Rene's lymph node dissection was beautiful yesterday, so he can do all this beautifully by VATS, but I would say that Joe Average out there, VATS surgeon, you know, some people don't do quite as much. The, the videos doing that sub ziphoid uniportal out in Shanghai, they, they, he did one pick of this, and then he was out. He wasn't doing a full lymphadenectomy, so... So uh, I think if, if you're not quite as dexterous with your vats, then uh, robotics you know, really is a great uh, way to do a good lymphadenectomy and a proper cancer operation. Yeah, I don't know, maybe that's a question for the audience. If you were having an operation, would you rather have vats or rather have a very good lymphadenectomy if you had T1A lung cancer? If you had to only choose one, a not very good lymph node dissection but VATS or a meticulous lymph node dissection through an anterolateral thoracotomy. I'd probably go for the good lymph node dissection. Tell me what my cancer is, tell me my stage. So, so you, you're choosing between VATS and a thoracotomy for lymph node dissection, right? Well, I'm just asking the question. Okay. If well, you were going in a peripheral okay. hospital and your dad was having an operation and, the sur and you watch the surgeon's video, he doesn't do very good lymphadenectomy and you know there's an open surgeon in the same centre, I'd probably say, mate, just go and have the open guy 
and get a good lymphadenectomy and we'll, we'll talk about painkillers. Obviously, the experts in the room can do both by VATS, but you know, there are some not great VATS surgeons doing not great lymphadenectomies. They'd probably be better off with a robot. So essentially, it's a question of uh, who prefers meticulous lymph node dissection to just lymph node sampling. Can we have a good show discussion. of hands for lymph node sampling? And just as Rene said Mechanism yesterday, you know, keeping this dry is really useful. I'm just going to attract a bit more. I think the argument's a little specious. It's, he's, he's a That's a bit better, isn't it? Let's, I was forgetting to move my third arm. It is a bit of a different sort of thing. And again, a lot of VAT surgeons use one hand to retract and then they're down to one-handed surgery. This, uh, you can always have two hands. I think he's just trying to you do just have to remember that you've got so that third hand. Surgeon's going to do no, corners with an open operation. Yeah. Well. yeah. So yeah. you need someone committed to doing the right thing. Whether it's a large vessel or open. Yes, well, this is that one. Does it that. make or break? No. Okay. Sir. I, I, I think the consensus is, uh, you know, you do need, uh, you know, uh, proper lymph node dissection. But, uh, you know, it's not necessarily that you have to go to the open surgeon. I'm just saying if you didn't have a good VAT surgeon, the best is a good VAT surgeon that does both, but uh, if you knew that your relative was about to go to someone that just picks at it, and you'll get one tiny, like they'll just take the top of this, and that they'll call a station seven. If I was a patient, I want all of station seven out, really. If I've got primary lung cancer, if it's a colorectal mat, I might be less bothered, but. So here's our. Station seven, just uh, getting it out. Try not to do too much blunt dissection. I kind of like to check it's pretty hemostatic. And I've got this swab just here to, to swab if I need. Obviously there's the vagus. Get up a little bit. Just fiddling with the focus. It's not quite an infinite depth of field focus. The, the Olympus camera's got infinite depth of field, so everything's always in focus, which I love, but this uh, isn't quite that. Seeing the esophagus there a bit better now. Who knows, might even see a thoracic duct if I'm lucky. Should go and find it, shouldn't I? So I was talking to one of my colleagues about, he, he said, oh, I've got a nice simple bronchogenic cyst just in this sort of station seven area. We had that exact case with Surf and, and he did it robotically and, the, and it turned out to be an esophageal cyst, not a bronchogenic cyst, but with a great vision and being able to see the vertical fibers of the esophagus, he still managed to do it very nicely. So there's the esophagus there, and, uh, and here's our station seven lymph node. Surf would have had this out in about five minutes, I'm just uh, being slow. I tend to always feel that speed should be the last thing to come. I'm sure Rene was only that quick in his second 2,000 cases that he's done. And, uh, and so the, the other thing that is very different in robotics is that it's very much a team uh, thing. I can't do any of this without uh, the team that's here today. They need to be well trained. They actually need to go online and do the <coughs> online robotic training so they know how to set up everything. And, and know where all the leads go, and they know about the protocols for safety. So, oops. I just burnt that a little bit, because uh, that just contacted. Shouldn't have done that. So, so you certainly, if you are setting up a program, you do need to realize that we are all, we're, it's much more of a team than a VATS procedure, where you can just, to a certain extent, just learn it yourself a little bit.
Yeah. Mm -hmm. and you mentioned that teamwork. Team um, what about from the yeah. anaesthetic side? How much involvement do they have uh, with setting up cases uh, like this? We've got Andy Lum here, he's a consultant anaesthetist. He's, uh, I think he's done the majority of the robotic cases. Um, in, our, in our institution, we started working with one. Have I changed this cigar? Thanks. Have another one. Just get one in, one out, like a hostage exchange. Um, so, I think uh, once you've got one good anaesthetist that you work with, um, you can, uh, you, uh, if you go in, one in first, just bring one in and then take one out, it's quicker. Um, if, you, if you've got one anaesthetist and they've worked with you from the start, then second anaesthetist can just come along, and uh, certainly our experience is once we've got one who knows how to do it, you know, it demystifies it quite a lot. Um, obviously, Andy probably be able to comment far better than me, but... Uh, but I think, you know, we just need the patient not to move. That's absolutely vital. These patients, if they move on the table, then the, the robot doesn't move. And so, so that can be very bad, the ports tear and things. But other than that, it's fairly similar to a VATS operation. So, and to, to that extent, they sometimes do some online Twitch meters. They've got some very nice, they've got a very nice computer automated Twitch monitor here. So they, they know for a fact what their muscle relaxation is doing. Um, our hospital uses uh, uh, atricurium infusions. I don't know if that's, the surf doesn't, but I'm not sure if we're on an infusion today, but that's, that's the only major difference really. The other thing is just having a view on getting to the tube safely. So, if, uh, so we, use a clear, uh, we use a clear drape over the head in James Cook so they can see the head very easily. We've not got that here today, but we've checked and he has got, and he's got fairly good access if we want to go and just puff the lung a little bit once we've done our... Sam, do you want to comment uh, or add comments? anything else to that? I'm not sure if he... Uh, Nathan? Someone going to buy me these Someone going to buy me these He's He's having his cup of tea, isn't he? Right, I've just chopped up the whole damn thing. And... Uh, Made this look messy now for a bit. Uh, we're just seeing if Andy Lum is yeah. able to talk to something with a microphone or not. Does he? He's got a big smile on his face. I think he's relishing the opportunity. Ask him if it's a piece of cake. <laughs> but can he talk to the audience or not? Yeah, buy your microphone. If he wants to stand next to me, he can. Uh, this is station seven. I've chopped it up a little bit in the face. Uh, Andy, I was just uh, really asking, from your point of view, have you had to change anything or are you more vigilant so that the patient stays absolutely still for the duration of the case? Better muscle relaxant management. Can you hear that right? Yeah, yeah, we can hear that. Can you hear that? Better muscle relaxant management. No, can't hear it. Yeah. no, no, we can hear you. That's fine. No, we can hear you. Oh, okay. Yeah, that's fine. They're slightly, just stunning. The, the, the slight cough that you occasionally get is seen as a bad thing if the robot's in because it doesn't move out of the way like it. And I'll yep. Move. Okay. Yeah. So that came in. And has it got caught in the CO2 the audience, yeah. Do you have any concerns about managing variations in blood pressure with the CO2 uh, in place? No, I have not, I've not managed that yet. Yeah. 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 I haven't noticed any significant effect of that in the cases that we've done so far. And the, the pressures are low enough, um, hopefully, for that not to make much difference. I haven't noticed any particular problem with CO2 absorption either, because you can, with laparoscopic stuff, that can be a risk. Um, but I haven't noticed that in the thoracoscopic cases. I'm just going to, he's lost the, the load. Manos, what you can do, so you might need to be near this. Uh, Manos, uh, there you go, there you go. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, yeah, you can chat again. Um, we just lost the uh, lymph node in the port, so you can disconnect the port, and we found it. <laughs> and again, because the, the port's under vision, I know it's not been lost in the chest, and there's not been any seeding for that. So... So, good thing. Did you get all that from Andy? Uh, yes, I did. Yes, I yeah, did. Yeah. The other thing is, is, the, is the position within the theatre of getting access to the patient. And it's obviously slightly harder with the robot coming over the top, but it's still manageable. Crawl around on our knees and get to get to. Yeah. <laughs> 
You know your place. You know your place. Absolutely. <laughs> Can you guys see the little camera sign at the top there? Nathan, can they see that? Yeah. There's a little camera sign up at the top there, and you can very easily get yourself accidentally disorientated. So that's just to help you know that you're straight on. So, so Joel, this is a question for Andy Lum. Uh -huh. Oh, yeah. Andy, you're back on. Andy? <laughs> He's drinking tea now. You're probably the... Yeah. This is a question from the audience. And you're probably the best yeah. person to answer this, given your interest in pulmonary physiology or pathophysiology. Now, the question is, does it make any difference to the dead space? Is that your question? The dead space will be longer because it's using extra long tubes. So, I mean, uh, because Joel's using extra long tubes, or you're using extra long tubes, does it make any difference to the dead space? And the ventilation? The tube. The tube is not longer. Tube. Yeah, no, it's no further away. He's no further away than a VATS case. We're not using extra long ventilation tubing. It's oh, you mean in terms of tube yeah, there's not bigger space. Ah, no, that makes no difference at all because that's part of the circle system. Yeah. It costs us a little bit more in anaesthetic to fill it <laughs> at the start of the case. But once it's full with the gases we want, it's it's no different at all. We won't tell Mr. Hunt that. Tell Mr. Hunt that. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I just think there's a little blood vessel just at the apex of the carina to these vessels. So it's always the one that bleeds as you do the last grass. Just trying to buzz it before it bleeds. myself not to grasp the lymph node packet and then I do and it falls to bits so again I learnt ladies from seeing Rene how delicately he holds the packet and uh, and he always seems to be able to get it out in a beautiful single uh, load so a bit more station seven there Let's know if that's out. I don't tend to do two four at the start. I do this bit just because I think it makes the operation easier. Don't think two fours makes things easier. Just uh, spotted a little something in there. Manos able to, uh, say, a few words. to uh, say a few words. <laughs> Manos? How are you doing, Manos? Are you able to comment on your experience so far? Experience so far? Just check that they can hear you by yeah, saying just hello. Say we might need to ask you later on because it's difficult to hear you. Difficult to hear you. So I believe his experience, and he'll correct me if I'm wrong, is eight cases, which is good. He's done a bilobectomy, um, and uh, and I think he hasn't had any conversions. And so, yeah, he's had a good experience so far. He's uh, joined the proctoring program, so Sash is the official official UK proctor, and uh, yeah, and uh, and so I think uh, they're getting on very nicely, really. Is that right, Manos? Yeah. What cases? Do I use what, sir? 
a glove. Well, the lymph nodes just now. Yeah. Uh, no. Yeah. Yeah. Um, no, because it's going through the port. The port's doing it all, isn't it? So, what node do people think that was? Was that uh, above or below the lower lobe bronchus? If it's below the lower lobe bronchus, it's 10. If it was above, it's small 7. What, does, what, what station does everybody think that was? Three level station was that. Richard? I'll just ask the trainees in the room. <laughs> 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 Get your IASLC posters out. Annabelle Sharkey. So it's, yeah, it's exactly here. Uh, I think that's the Karina's up there. Yeah, I haven't got the best view of the Annabelle left Sharkey main bronchus. Seven. Seven. There's the left main bronchus. Seven. seven, yeah. So there's the left main bronchus, I can just see there. Seven. Right main bronchus, it was just there. The, look, it's got to be below the lower lobe bronchus, isn't it? So 10 probably about there, so I would give her 10 out of 10, she can come work for us. Excellent. <laughs> so that was seven, that manners. By consensus, I like this. Can I do all my operations by consensus? It's great. So, so I think, you know, that people think that was pretty good. That was almost as good as Rene's uh, lymphadenectomy, apart from it took twice as long. So we've got a nice sort of clean area there. And, uh, and so I'm fairly happy with that.